Hello, I'm Dave Boyd with the Potter Shop Hollow Tree Farm and Portable Sawmill. I run this Norwood HD 36 as part of my business and this video is on how to maintain a sawmill. Now whether it's portable or stationary, hydraulic or manual, whether it's for business or for your own use, there's a lot of things that you can do to keep it tweaked in, cut straight lumber, keep your engine running strong and enjoy it even more than you do. All right, let's start out with the tools of the trade. I keep all the tools for the sawmill in one bag. This is my sawmill tool bag. It stays with the sawmill and the tools stay in the bag. It's so easy. If you need a 9 16 wrench for some other project, just run, grab one out of the bag, use it. Forget where you had it. Next time you need it for the sawmill, you might even be out on a customer site or in a remote location. You reach in for a 9 16 wrench and it isn't there. So these tools stay with the bag. They only exist when I'm running the sawmill. Okay. So every morning without exception, first thing before I start up the engine is to check the oil. Now the engine has a low oil shutoff switch, but I don't want to depend on that. So uh, it takes nothing to check it, make sure it's about right within operating parameters before I start it up. The sawmill operates in an extreme dust environment, so it's a good idea to clean the air filter daily. I haven't done it for a while, so let's see if there's any sawdust in there. Whoa, this is worse than I thought. At the very least, knock off as much sawdust as you can, but better yet, blow the dust off with compressed air going from the inside of the filter to the outside. You might even consider taking a filter home to clean if you have an air compressor in the shop. Guess I better take my own advice and shake the dust off of this one once in a while. Now the filter is due for a change. We'll get to that later, but for now we'll use it a bit longer. Just a note about fuel. Uh, first of all, I like to fill it before I start cutting make sure that uh, I don't run out in the middle of a cut when it's inconvenient to fill it. This way I can lower the head down to a convenient height. And I always use ethanol free gas. Can't have it at least just use premium gas. It's a, it is a better quality in general though you do pay more for it. But the, uh, the ethanol can tend to gum up a carburetor and cause all kinds of problems. So. Uh, Pass it all free whenever you possibly can. Every day at the end of the job, I always loosen up the blade so it uh, doesn't wear a flat spot. And you always want to remember to tighten that thing back up before you start to use it next time. I have forgotten, and it'll throw the blade off pretty quick. And a lot of times it'll put a kink in the blade, and that's not a real good way to start out a day saw milling. So uh, make sure you, make sure you remember to retention the blade before you start. I put the key in a separate place so that when the key's not in the ignition, I remember. Oh yeah, tension the blade before you start the machine. So my general rule of thumb is if there's a grease zerk anywhere, it's there for a reason, and that reason is for lubrication. So any place where there's a grease zerk every now and then, I'll go ahead and give it a shot just to make sure that everything keeps going freely. Some mills have welded fixed backstops. Uh, this particular mill has an adjustable one. Personally, what I like to do, since I know that the mill is level, is to put a carpenter's level on it, push against it like there was a log rolling on it, and you can see that bubble is centered, so we've got it exactly where we want it to be. That'll give us perfectly square cans. But uh, as long as we've got the cover off, a couple of things to look for. Uh, look at belt tension. You can look to see if there are any obvious cracks in it, uh, which would be a good indication that maybe it's time to think about uh, putting on a fresh belt. And I put my hand on the bearing after it stopped 
just to feel of whether or not it's warm. And that's an indication that there, I may be uh, developing a problem with that bearing. Of course, I do the same on both sides. And since this mill does not use sealed bearings, I like to give it a shot of grease every time I change out band wheels. If of course, any time you're changing blades, you ought to be wearing leather gloves. Uh, even a dull blade can slice you up pretty good, and a sharp blade is like shaking hands with a piranha. So we'll keep all our fingers intact here. And we've got the blade loosened up, and should slip right off. Once you get used to it, you can give it a flip up and nothing to it. So to uncoil a blade, just pull it apart a little bit, give it a little toss, and it comes right apart. All right, Ray put it back on the mill. So we'll carefully work it onto the band wheels through the guides. bring up a little bit of tension and we're not going to go super tight just yet we're just going to get it good and snug here there we go and turn the band wheel by hand and we want to make sure everything's turning freely and listen for any scraping sound that sounds good so we'll go ahead and bring it up to tension Follow your manufacturer's specifications on this. Uh, after a while, you'll get a feel for it. But uh, there are tension meters uh, that, that you can get. But uh, it goes tighter than what you might think. Once you've tensioned the blade, good idea to give it a spin. Make sure it's turning freely. And then we'll take a look at the tracking and make sure that it's riding exactly on the right place on that band wheel. When you set your tracking, you want to make sure you have your blade up to full tension. There are some mills, and this is the HD36 is one of them, that as you change your tension, it's going to change your tracking a little bit. So you can't do it with a loose blade. We need to torque this thing down. And we'll get that to about the tension recommended by the manufacturer. Uh, on this mill, we've got the, the tracking screw right here. By the way, you've got tracking on both band wheels. So I'm going to just show you for one, but you need to get them both to be the same. What I'm looking for is to have the body of the blade, in other words, the part between the bottom of the gullet and the back side of the band are pretty well centered on the pulley and you need to do that of course on both sides and if you do that it should ride pretty level. The Norwood HD36 uses ceramic guides uh, no moving parts which is good news and if you get everything adjusted right they do a good job of holding the blade straight and basically you want each one just a few thousandths about the thickness of a sheet of paper which is about three thousandths above and below and so that the blades not quite touching and so and you can feel just a little bit of movement up and down so if the blade starts to deflect the guide will hold it that's all you want now if you need to adjust it in or out that's when you come in loosen this up Set, your side set screw and you can slide it in and out. I like to slide it just about an eighth of an inch back of the blade and that's where I'll tighten it down. This adjusts, lets you adjust the angle and your course adjustment up and down 
And all you, have, all you do is just loosen it. Take on this mill it takes a nine sixteenths. So you want it so it's perfectly square or parallel to the blade on, on those ceramic guides. So once you get it where you want it, hang on us while we're tightening it down. Okay, changing the oil is not my favorite thing in the world to do. I usually wind up with oil all over the sawmill, all over me, all over the ground. And uh, I don't do it any more often than I need to. But on the other hand, it's good for the engine. Yeah, a new engine, I think five to ten hours for break-in. Then you change the oil and after that, uh, follow the manufacturer's recommendation. It's probably one of the cheapest insurances that you can have that your engine is going to have a long life to it. So we're going to try an experiment here. I've got this oil suction kit that I bought at the local uh, home and garden shop. And what you're supposed to do is to stick the small tube down the oil dipstick tube and all the way down to the bottom of the crankcase and then pump it out and if that works that'll be well worth the 12 bucks that I spent on this. There are other kits that you can get that attach to the drain valve that you just open up a stopcock and that might be a better option but uh, we're going to start here and see how this works but no matter how you do it change the oil. Feels like it's going all the way down to the bottom. Uh, uh, hopefully that's the bottom of the block. And we'll activate our siphon and see what happens. Okay, always good to have a good container handy. And Feels like it's trying to move some oil here. I feel some resistance to it. And I think once we get it started, it'll siphon on its own. While we're at it, we'll go ahead and put on a new air filter. Uh, that last time we checked it, it was pretty dusty. And so, uh, anytime we change the oil and the oil filter, uh, air filter goes right along with it. fresh air foam filter so everything's new on here and you'll get plenty of nice clean air yeah. it's a pretty extreme dusty environment so air filter is going to I can say to clean it off on a daily basis is a pretty good idea and change it whenever you change your other filters there we go these plugs uh, say they're the official spark plug of the NHRA, so I don't intend to compete with my sawmill in any hot rod racing events. On the other hand, if it's good enough for them, I guess it's good enough for an old Briggs and Stratton engine. Okay. Two things when you're changing your spark plug to make sure. One, of course, that the engine is turned off. And the other thing is the engine should be cold when you do this. So uh, you can see a little bit of carbonization on there. Uh, not too bad a shape. I'll probably just throw it in the toolbox for a spare in case I need one down the line. This one. Uh, fresh out of the package. We want 30 thousandths according to the manual and that's the 30 thousandths blade on the feeder gauge and it feels pretty close to right otherwise you'd want to adjust it a little bit you just want to be able to slide that feeder gauge um, between the tip and the electrode with a little bit of resistance 
slip that in place. Try not to cross thread it, of course. And tighten. And we're just gonna snug it down. You have an aluminum head, so you really don't want to go tight enough to strip your threads, of course. And we'll just snug it, put the cap back on. Of course, there's two cylinders to this, and you always want to do them both at the same time. So, there we go. Well, while we're at it, let's do the fuel filter. Uh, they're cheap, but it's pretty quick to replace them, so there's no reason not to. So, just got a couple of clamps to loosen here, and one is a spring clamp and the other is a screw clamp. I don't know why, that's just the way it came, so have both tools available. Slide the clamps out of the way. And I've found it's real handy to use vice grips to clamp off the line between the fuel tank and the filter. That way gas doesn't come pouring out of it. And I'd like to I like to keep a can handy just to catch any gas that might be spilling. Pull the filter off and uh, we'll put on a new one. Fuel filters always have an arrow with the word flow. It tells you the direction that the gasoline has to go to get through it. And uh, you always want to make sure that it's pointed in that direction. So uh, the arrow points towards the engine. Reset our clamps. And we can cross that job off our list. Well, let's see how our oil draining project is coming along. Uh, we've got quite a bit. Hard to know if we got it all. Time for the moment of truth. I'm going to pull that drain plug and we'll just see how much oil we lose. I do have a reservoir here to catch some of it because I know we couldn't possibly have gotten all of it out. Turn it by hand from there. We'll just give it a minute before we put that drain plug back in. And hopefully we'll catch it all here. And I'm going to call that good enough. Almost none. Left in the crankcase a little bit, a little bit spilled on the machine, but enough we can just wipe up with a paper towel and we'll tighten down that plug and fill up and be done with it. So we'll just uh, replace the plug here. There we go. Then we're going to change the filter and we'll be ready to put in some fresh oil. If you have a well-equipped shop with an oil filter wrench, that's the easiest way to do it. Uh, barring that, you probably won't be able to get it off by hand. But a real easy way is to take a hammer and a screwdriver and just tap it just enough to turn it. Like that. To where you can but remove it by hand and when you pull that oil filter uh, good to have something to catch the oil you're going to lose a little bit more here and this just keep us from making quite so much of a mess there we go there we go when you put on your new filter, you want to put a little oil 
on that rubber gasket to make it seal better. And put it on. And all we're going to do is just go hand tight. You know, go as tight as you can, but don't use a wrench. All you need to do is just compress that seal a little bit. That's good enough. Now, a little bit of oil to soak up here. And then we'll be ready to fill our reservoir. Well, it seems like I do a little bit neater job when I use a funnel. So, borrowed one. And this uh, type of oil you use just depends on what the manufacturer recommends. But they all caution you, do not overfill. The uh, manual for the Briggs & Stratton Vanguard 23 horse says that it should take 1.8 quarts. So that's just a little shy of two quarts. And uh, that's about what we put in. We're right about where we need to be on the dipstick. And we'll also uh, check it after we've run it for a little bit, make sure the oil gets um, worked all the way in, and then add a little more if we need to. But Put on our oil cap, and all right, and don't forget when you put this back with your wife's funnels and cooking equipment, be sure and wipe it down real well first, otherwise, they might get a little upset. Just, uh, just kidding, Becky, really, in case you see this, uh, this is a shop funnel. So, I hope you got something out of this video, and uh, until next time, I'm Dave Boyt, and uh, keep on making sawdust. And remember, don't forget to uh, pet the roses and smell the dog. Uh, smell the roses and pet the dog. And uh, cookies always taste better when you share them with a friend. There you go. Good old girl. Good old girl. Hey, this is sunshine.